United lost 3-0 at home against Liverpool. And I just got to rant a little bit. I've got to let you know how I feel. I've got to express some of my feelings. I know sometimes on Taz, the, you know, some of you don't want to hear some of my football talks. Some of you might think I'm a little bit clueless. Some of you just don't like sports in general. I understand it. But please allow me 20 minutes or so to just rant because I'm so annoyed and so pissed off. Even now, so many hours after the fact, I am still annoyed at the way we performed. I'm not really that pissed off about the result. I'm not going to lie. Liverpool are, despite losing Klopp, they're still a better team, right? They're still well drilled. Like it doesn't, you know, you'd have to be a really bad manager to take over from Klopp and have Liverpool looking like Sheffield United or something. It's not going to happen. But the manner of the defeat is what I'm really annoyed about. The manner. There's ways to lose games. There's ways to lose games. And I think personally for me, I think over the years, our standards have dropped so much so where I think this is going to be a bit of a stretch to say, but I think at a club like Real Madrid, if you lost 3-0, 7-0, all these crazy, you know, defeats against your bitter local rivals, no matter what you did previously, that should put you up for the sack. Because those are the type of games where if you can't get the players up for this, if you can't get them well drilled enough, to, even just to kind of batten down the hatches and not concede more than two goals, you deserve to go. That's the level of team that we're at. That's the level of performance we need from our players. And if they can't match that and they can't do that, of course we can't get rid of all the players as much as I would like to. I'm sure a lot of United fans out there would like to see a lot of these players go. We can't get rid of all of them. You have to then decide, you know, let's get rid of the manager because he's the one person that we can change relatively easily. But we didn't. So let's not go over the manager two things so far. Let's just go over the game. And I'm going to give you my impression of the game. Number one, the game. Before the game even starts off, for me, the, before the game even starts off, the lineup already annoyed me. The lineup annoyed me because of the admission of Anana. No, the admission of Ahmad Yellow. Sorry, not Anana. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here saying United would have won that game if Ahmad Yellow was playing on the right hand side or the left hand side instead of Ganaccio or Rashford. Don't get me perturbed. I'm not that dumb. I'm not that stupid. I'm not that naive. I'm not that short sighted. But. What the selection or the lack of selection of Amadiello tells me is that the manager still doesn't know who his best players are. Still doesn't know who his best players are. Because in my opinion, even if the manager said, you know what, I want more pace. I want more direct pace behind the defenders. I want more players who can maybe, I don't know what you can say about Garnaccio is different to Ahmed. Maybe I want, I want more players that can run in behind their defender. I want more players that are going to face up to their defender. I want more players that can run off the ball. Cool. But I'm sort of the thinking, United are playing so terribly at the moment. We're such in a weird state of flux that you probably just need to have all your best players playing. It doesn't matter if sometimes against certain opposition, you need someone to be a bit taller for set pieces. No, 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 no. At this stage of our development, at this stage of our transition, we just need our best players on the pitch. Like Bruno Fernandes. I'm not the biggest fan of Bruno Fernandes, but he's one of our best players. You put him on the pitch. You figure out a way to make him work. Cool. So when I didn't see Ahmad Diallo on the lineup, I already got worried because I was like, oh, this manager doesn't know what he's doing. We're already two, no, three games into the season. It's pretty obvious that Ahmad, from what we have available, is quite likely our best winger, in my opinion. In terms of, you know, ball retention, in terms of short passing, in terms of shots, in terms of dribbling, in terms of just everything, he's probably our all-around best winger in our team even though i think long term you'll probably end up being a little bit more on the inside you might end up developing into a number 10 or even playing off the striker but as it stands right now amadiello is our best winger you don't play him for me that's a big concern all right cool then you play xerxes up front on his own basically and i'm also concerned because from what i've seen so far my night don't have a good way of like integrating our strikers hoyland struggled at first when he joined United in the second half of the season he kind of improved but there was a lack of kind of cohesion and kind of flow and balls coming into Hoyland so immediately when I saw Zerski up, up front I was a little bit worried also a little bit worried also just because in general our strikers tend to suffer because we don't really I'm not too sure why this is the case if it's the manager telling the players to do play a certain way if it's our players reluctancy to pass on new players but whenever a new striker joins United especially in recent years they've always struggled playing up front for United and playing in goal for United might be two of the hardest positions and most scrutinized positions in world football I swear to God um, and Zerks I feel completely sorry for him he really tried his heart out but he looked dog shit Continuing on with the game, 
when the game started, um, it was fairly obvious to me one side in Liverpool was setting traps, pressing the opposition, and also keeping the ball better. The other side, which is United, were looking for the long counter every single time. And in my opinion, that long counter was never on. Because neither Rashford or Garnacho has the ability to keep the ball well enough to get past two or three defenders and then get a shot on goal. They're, they're all kind of too, you know, 50-50 when it comes to their ability to successfully dribble, in my opinion. I think if you have Liverpool playing as they did before against Klopp, with Klopp, sorry, they would push a bit more higher and there'd be more space Rashford and Gacha to run onto. This time round, with Arnie Slough, this Liverpool, they don't push that far up. They don't leave so many gaps. Yes, there are some gaps, but not enough for Rashford to run onto. And Rashford and Garnacho is again, don't have the best touch into their feet. It's always a little bit, you know, a bit of a fumble. They're having to catch up to the ball. So those fumbles give people time to close the space and there you go. So I was preferring how Liverpool was playing. I was looking at the game and I was surprised by how good Gravenberch looked for Liverpool. I, for some reason, mistakenly thought Gravenberch was more of a destroyer type of midfielder, more combative. But in this particular game, it seems that Soboslai and McAllister were really doing a good job of like plugging that midfield gap and letting Gravenberch just like raid forward. He had two or three particular runs in the first half that really filled me with dread because he got the ball in a half term spun and was past like half of our midfield, if not half of our team, all the way onto goal. That already gave me issue because in my opinion, I prefer to see football played in a way where there's a bit more control. I think most of us do. I think we're so, I'm personally, I'm not sure about you if you're a United fan. I'm sick and tired. I'm not going to lie. I am sick and tired of heavy metal football. I'm sick and tired of heavy metal football. I'm sick and tired of having that swift counter-attacking thing, always running, everybody busting a gut, people just like bleep test football. I've had enough of it. I want to see us control games. I want to see us go back to actually killing games even. Who would have known that, right? Getting a, getting a couple goals ahead and deciding to kill a game. We don't even do that anymore. So when I was seeing us play, I was very worried because even though we did have a couple of quote-unquote attacks and maybe chances, it did look like Liverpool were more in control. The other worrying part for me in the first half was that Liverpool didn't really get out of second gear. Didn't really get out of second gear, in my personal opinion. They beat us resoundedly. As you can see from the screen, they beat us 3-0 resoundedly. Wasn't even close. And the scary thing is, I don't think they got out of second gear. I think Liverpool can be much better than that, but they still beat us 3-0. That is where, as United fan, you have to be worried. Because we had all our players fit, with the exception of, what, Hoyland and Luke Shaw. Luke Shaw doesn't really exist because he's consistently injured and his contract should get fucking terminated if it was up to me. But he's white and English, so it's not going to happen. So fuck him. But you've got Hoyland as the only player out, really. Ugati, you can't really include him because he's not really in our team yet at the moment. We were missing, technically. Or maybe Malaysia. Maybe technically four players. But only probably two of them really are important to our first team. And Liverpool beat us resoundedly. And look at the bench that they had when they, when they made the substitutions. Look at how strong their bench was compared to ours as well when they made the substitutions. A well-balanced team, well-drilled, knows what to do with a new manager, obviously looking to prove things. Then, of course, when they scored the first goal, um, the Trent Alexander goal, that was very worrying already. It kind of felt like it was an omen that they were going to score. I didn't feel like, you know, in previous times when a team scores a goal and it gets ruled off for offside, and then it kind of gives the home or the team that got scored against confidence. Oh, yeah, cool, man. We got away with that one. Cool. Let's go and get them back. I don't think that happened. If anything, it kind of got, it kind of a regener, it kind of a revived and regenerized, re, re energized, sorry, Liverpool. It kind of got them going. It kind of got them to be a bit more precise. And they took every single one of their chances. Luis, Luis Diaz absolutely tore us apart. I can't even imagine how lethal Liverpool will be if they find out a way to get Chiesa fit. Because he has, you know, he's, he, has, he has a lot of consistent niggly injuries. I'm a big fan of his. Watched him a lot in Juve. Uh, like he's definitely a talent. I like that type of winger anyway. Very kind of direct. He kind of reminds me of Joachim from back in the day and Robert Tease. If you know, you know. He's got that very direct, like, going at you fucking style. If Liverpool managed to get Chiesa up and running and they managed to get him fit, they managed to give him a couple of inhalers or something, Yo, Liverpool's attack is going to be scary with having 
Luis Diaz and fucking Chiesa on the wings, and then whoever they want playing through the middle, whether it's Salah, whether it's fucking Darwin Nunes, if he ends up kind of, you know, pulling off the trees this season, they're going to be quite scary. But for me, the most important and pressing thing about Liverpool was their midfield compactness. All across, actually forget midfield, their team compactness. Very rarely did I see, um, what's his name? Um, Andy Robertson or Trent Alexander-Arnold out of position. Very rarely did we see them stretched all over the pitch. Very rarely did we see Van Dijk having to lunge, having to overextend. Um, even Konate, who's got a mistake in him, he didn't really make any. The spaces were so compact beyond all of these these players. McAllister, Gravenberch, Robertson, Van Dijk, Conte, um, Andrew, um, what you got, Trent Alexander-Arnold, just compact. And then when it went up front to the players that also had the skills and the whatever... They didn't destroy us with Sober Slide Jota, everybody else. You know what I mean? They just kind of went, they went a bit, ramp, they, they kind of ran us ragged in that regard. But we couldn't get out. We couldn't get out of a half. We couldn't string any parties together. And of course, the, the, the most concerning part of it was the first half was obviously Casemiro's performance. Casemiro's performance, right, was really bad. Really bad. Maybe one of the worst midfield performances I've seen outside of like performances you see from like Scott McTominay and Fred back in the day. But the scary thing about the Casemiro performance, none of us were surprised. We've seen him perform like that against, I think it was Brentford last year. I think it was Brentford last year. He had one of the worst midfield performances ever. Ever, 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 ever. Gave the ball away loads of times. I think he even gave the ball away conceding a goal. And even back then, a lot of us United fans are saying, why aren't we not transitioning from this guy? Why are we not going getting in the player to replace him? Why are we not trying to phase him out of the team? Because unfortunately, we tried to buy this Real Madrid guy to go. We fought really highly of him. And then, you know, it didn't work out. It's, it is what it is. But we got one good year out of him. But I thought even if we gave him a long contract, we would have had in place a player that he could maybe mentor or play alongside. And then little by little, we could phase him out of the team and then let him go. But as you know, with United... United don't let go of players when they have to get let go. We let go of players far beyond their time where they should get let go. Like Scott McTominay. Scott McTominay, bless him, he should have been out of the club two years ago. He's, he was never good enough to play for United. He's probably lucky to play for Napoli. Fred, the same thing. Martial, the same thing. Maguire, probably still at the club, the same thing. Shaw, the same thing. De Gea, look how long De Gea stayed at the club. So we have this tendency to hold on to players that we probably should phase out a long time anyway. So as much as I want to sit here and blame Casemiro for how badly he played, I can't really. Because he shouldn't be at the club. He shouldn't be at the club. He should have got replaced in the summer. He should have got replaced last season even. He should have been replaced by now. And if you're Eric Ten Hag, and your way of playing football relies, because some people will say that Eric Ten Hag is struggling now because of his lack of a, a being able to get a Frankie de Jong type player. Because in his first season when he joined United, the major thing we heard about him was that he wanted Frankie de Jong. Frankie de Jong, Frankie de Jong. Frank. If I get Frankie de Jong, all my prayers will be answered. We get it. He's a great player. I think he's currently out injured. Great player is amazing. I understand. But that type of profile of a player, I'm not too sure about you guys, but they're not that common. That's why he's special. But he's also injured. And he also didn't want to come to United. So you have to figure out another option. But if that position is really important to how you play, if that position is vital, you have to find a better replacement for Casemiro. You have to. If, if your football relies on having really fit and mobile fullbacks, really combative and ball-playing centre-backs, really tackle-aggressive, on-the-front-foot, good ball-carrier DMs, you have to get those players. There's no excuses. If you don't get them, and then you have to rely on Casemiro, that's on you. Because we, all, we already know Casemiro is prone to making loads of unforced errors that lead to goals. We know that about him. That's not his fault. I don't think so. I can't blame him for playing shit because that's what we know him to do. The game that he played in the first game of the season against Fulham, that was the exception to the rule. We're going to get more games like he played against Liverpool than what he played against Fulham. That's why he got dropped for the FA Cup game, by the way. If you, if you may not fans don't remember. That's why he got dropped for the FA Cup game. He didn't get dropped for the FA Cup game. He didn't get dropped for the FA Cup game because, you know, the manager doesn't like him. Because he couldn't get trusted. And it proved to be right. Because we won the we got won the game anyway. So I can't really blame Casemiro too much. And the other thing about it as well, even if I do want to blame Casemiro, I watched the game with my eyes. And I'm sorry. But Casemiro 
should never be receiving the ball where he receives the ball. He clearly makes loads of mistakes when he receives the ball really, you know, deep, basically. He's just not mobile enough. He hasn't got the spatial awareness. He doesn't got the... He hasn't got the, you know, the sense of touch or whatever. He's just not good in that position. But what I have seen him do good at is being further forward, actually. Winning the ball back further forward, if that's possible. If there's like two types of DMs, if there's a DM that flanks or that kind of covers the centre-backs and there's a DM that tries to win the ball further up, I think Casemiro is one of those DMs that wins the ball further up. But when it's deep, he's poor, especially if defenders are passing him the ball. I've seen that whenever he has a, he's back to the opposing goal, he, he's really, he really struggles to figure out where he is. Cool. I think as well, the players around him need to take responsibility. There was a couple of passes, especially from Dalo, that he was given to Casemiro, where he was surrounded by three Liverpool players. And it was pretty obvious to me, not sure if you guys have seen this, it was pretty obvious to me, the Liverpool players were actually purposely targeting Casemiro. He seemed to be the trigger. Casemiro and Kirby Mino seemed to be the triggers. Whenever they got the ball, Liverpool's defenders were pouncing them. Even, I think, Lissandra Martins to a certain extent. They would go and hassle and harry them. Even maybe um, Mateus De Ligt, he was like kind of struggling on the ball a couple of times. But Casemiro was the main one. If that's mean I'm your teammate, I'm going to notice that and stop giving you the ball where there's, you've got a million fucking ops around you. Giving the ball where he's a bit more free. So I think they were purp they, not purposely. I think they were kind of putting the guy in trouble by giving the ball away. Got give the ball. Obviously, when he gave the ball away, inexcusable. But I still think, especially for the second goal, the second goal that, that Luis Diaz scored. Yes, Casemiro's ball was intercepted and then it went. But that that was there was still a lot of passenger play before the ball went into the center of the box and Luis Diaz finished it the way he did. There was still a lot of time for us to recover the ball. And I feel like, I don't know about you guys, but whenever I played football, even Sunday League, even forget me playing football Sunday League, but look at a team like Man City, even some of the smaller teams. Whenever a, a player in the team makes an unforced error that could potentially lead to a goal, the other players hassle. They all run around. They all like trying to make sure that they save the player because that's their boy. That's their teammate. They don't want to concede a goal like that. If they want to concede a goal, they want to concede a goal because the other team is playing really flipping well, right? They want to fucking go. They want to fucking go. They want to fucking go. Da, 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 da. But it does happen to United. It's almost like we let it happen. There's no real oomph. There's no real, you know, effort to get back. Dallow's too far forward. Where's Lissandro Martinez? Where's Mateus De Ligt? All over the place. It's almost like when he gave away the ball, oh, we're going to concede now. No one really cares too much. And obviously, we go and concede and the game's over. But I was also happy, and this is a weird thing to say, I was also happy that in the second half, although there was no, there was no other option but to take Casemiro off because at that point, he was trying to jeopardize the team, right? And maybe he wasn't able to kind of turn it around. Maybe the manager saw he doesn't have because. If it, if it was me and I was being a little bit critical of Everton Hug, I would say maybe the cop-out and the easy thing is to take Casemiro off. Maybe leaving him on for maybe 10 minutes to see if he can kind of turn himself back on again and kind of stamp his authority, right? And kind of wake up a bit might be a bit beneficial because to throw Toby Collier on, the young kid who also struggled, was a little bit unfair to kind of cover for Casemiro's mistakes. But I understand at that point, it was getting a little bit untenable. He had to come off. Cool, no problem. I was happy... In the second half, it continued as per normal. I was happy in the second half. Nothing really changed. If anything, the mistake that led to the third goal, guess who Guess who did it? Kobe Mino. So the same player that... So Casemiro was making loads of mistakes in that position. Unforced errors, which lead to goals. Two, he did. He gets subbed at halftime. Then, Cas then Mino puts into the position. Toby Coley goes forward. Mino gives, gives the ball away. Bang. Third goal, the game's over. So to me, that's proof that Eric Ten Hag has set this team up in a way that the players keep on making the same mistakes. His tactics, his formations, the lack of style of play, whatever's going on, is atrocious. Now, I'm not sitting here saying that the way I like to see football played is the only way I like to see football played. I want to see control. I want to see dominance. I want to see quote-unquote tiki-taka football. I want to see us suck the life out of teams through just keeping the ball. That's what I prefer to see. And then hitting the teams on a break and being fucking lethal and aggressive. Like, a good mix for me would be a mix between, like, I don't know, Borussia, Borussia Dortmund under Tuchel and a pomp, a little bit of Real Madrid now, and a little bit of Man City. That would be my perfect blend of style of play. 
But I'm also appreciative if Elton Hag wants to play this gung-ho, over-the-top football, cool. But then get the players who can do that for you. Have, have tactics and formation that can, get the, that can execute that style of play the best. And so far, after three years at the club, we are nowhere closer to seeing exactly what he wants. We're nowhere closer to seeing it, especially not for a sustained period. Especially not if players get injured. It seems like as soon as a uh, first teammate gets injured, our fucking standards drop considerably. As soon as a, someone who's the first option gets injured, we are nowhere to be seen. And for me, that's not a good that's not a good sign that he's been able to you know build or cultivate a good style of play when clearly it's mostly player dependent. Because any manager can do that. Any manager can sit there and say, "Oh, I need the best players in order to win games." Cool. But really, the, the, the real barometer, I think, of coaching, especially in the league, is being able to coach a variety of players, different levels of talent and ability, temperament, all that malarkey, and be able to consistently finish, a, you know, in a particular place. Top four, top ten, you know, top two, whatever, winning the league. That's actually a better, better barometer. Because anybody, if they had all the best players, could probably figure it out. But how about if you don't? How about if you have a couple of weak links? How about if you had a couple of weak links? How about if you have a couple weak links? What are you going to do then? Exactly. So I was really annoyed that we didn't see that. But I was also happy to see that regardless of the changes made, the results kept being the same. The only thing that was different, actually, weirdly enough, as soon as Ahmad Yellow came on, look how the game changed. Look how the game changes when one of our better players and one of the players who's been able to keep the ball better comes on and plays well. Look what happens. Look what happens. And again, it's not to say Ahmad Yellow is going to change everything and he's our saviour because we have a saviour complex at United anyway. But it's clear when Ahmad Yellow plays football for us, we play better. So I would just like to see in this short space of time, because Ayrton Howard doesn't have long at the club anymore. He should not be at the club anyway. He should not be our manager. He's fucking garbage. He got lucky that the Ineos were just cowardly and didn't want to pull the trigger and go for an un- Go for a, a managerial choice that was still as much as a risk as keeping him. Because I guess Enios looked at the climate. No, I guess Enios looked at the landscape of managers available. And they were like to themselves, you know what? No one that's available right now is better than what we have, they, feel, they thought. Or is a clear upgrade. So they reg they'd, re they'd rather stay with him. And of course, a lot of it had to do with the fucking good feeling around the FA Cup game. So it wasn't really, you know, there wasn't a lot of uh, rational thinking behind it. Or critical thinking behind it. But I hope now going forward, for the short time Eric Ten Hag does have available at the club, just play your best players, bro. You're not going to be here long enough anyway. Just play your best players and let them work it out. If you're not going to, if you're not going to coach them, if you're not going to have a good style of play, whatever, just put your best players on the pitch. And one of these best players is Ahmad Diallo. And the more he doesn't pick him, and the more he continues to pick Rashford and doesn't sub him, like that substitution at the end. That substitution at the end. No one's saying Garnacho was playing like Ronaldo. Nobody is saying Garnacho was playing like fucking Messi. But taking off Garnacho before you take off Rashford? That already I can know. I know you're clueless. I know you're fucking clueless. If you're taking off Garnacho before you're taking off Rashford, I know you're clueless. Because one player does nothing. One player is at least trying to do something. Absolutely joke thing. Joke thing completely. Um, Liverpool deserved the victory. Nothing more to be said really about how they played. Don't really give a fuck. I hope the whole, whole fucking stadium burns down and they bust, you know, fucking careers off the side of a mountain. Especially fucking, you know, Trent Alexander-Arnold trying too hard to like, to like make us hate that. Bro, your face is too soft. We're not going to hate you the way we hated Steven Gerrard. We don't care. Do you know what I mean? You're not putting up numbers. You're not one of the best players. In the world. Like, relax. Like, trying way too hard to kind of be unlikable. I get it though. Fair play. It's a derby. They won. Hands up and shit. But God almighty, man. When, when will we be able to put the beatings on Liverpool? When will we be able to put a real beating on City? A real beating on our local right? Like, when would that happen ever again? Like, like it, will we still be around to see United back to their pomp or back to where they, be, where they belong? Even AC Milan have kind of recovered. Right? Even Juve got relegated. They come back. They kind of recovered. We're the only side. We're the only one. We're one of the only last big teams that are still struggling. Even Arsenal. Even Arsenal look like they're on their way. Arsenal figured it out somehow. They figured it out. Chelsea look like they might be figuring it out with, with for fucking, um, what's his name? Um, Maresco over there. Even they look like they're figuring it out. And they've got 100 players on their books. Even he's going to be figuring it out. But we're still in this lurch. It's so fucking annoying. I hate every part of it. I really do hate every part of it. And to be honest, 
it's gonna get worse before it gets better. That's the that's the scary part of it. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. International break now. Probably the worst time for us anyway, international break. Because it gives the players a reason to kind of like run away and not want to pay attention and not want to fix things. Because I think like another game is the best way to fix something. But we've got two weeks now with no United. I guess for my heart temperature, it's a good thing. But for the players, for the accountability, not a good thing at all. Not a good thing at all. And um, yeah, man, not surprised. Not surprised we lost the way we lost. The manager's comments after the game. The manager's comments after the game. I don't know if he, I don't know if Eric Ten Hag thinks we're silly, thinks we're dumb. I don't know if he thinks that we're dumb. I don't think I don't know if he like on one side of things. I understand if I was him. I guess we're all the same. If we're getting criticised, right? If we're getting criticised, it's really difficult to take it gracefully. It's really difficult to take accountability, especially when people are saying it's like all your fault, which it's not. It's not all his fault. It's mostly his fault, but it's not all his fault. If you had to did it in a, if you had to you know, attribute blame as a percentage, you would say Eric Ten Hag is probably 70% to blame. Right? 70% to blame, you'd probably say, for our current predicament, probably 70% to blame. Maybe when we get Ogati up and running and other players come in, maybe 80, but he's about 70% to blame. But the way he speaks after the after games, the comments about not being Harry Potter, the comments about us being the best team behind Man City, even though we finished eighth last season, only because of winning trophies. The comments about him going back home for that journalist. God bless that journalist, by the way. God bless that journalist for telling him, hey, maybe it's your maybe it's your tactics, right? Have you ever considered maybe it might be your coaching? Oh, no. How can it be my coaching? What mistakes have I made? He thought he put it on the man. He, the man just so dumb. He thought he put it on the journalist. He thought he, like, put him up against the wall and gagged him. Oh, what mistakes am I making then? And the journalist just, like, listing mistakes. Bah, 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 bah. And, you know, he was just doing that weird fucking laugh. That weird psycho laugh going, it's like, and then obviously Arnie Sloth after the game like succinctly broke down our tactics in like a minute 30 seconds. He broke down how to beat us <laughs> in a minute 30 seconds. And obviously the proofs didn't put it because they won 3-0. I was like, you know what? Fair play, man. Fair play. I wanted you to fail. I wanted to call him the bold fraud. But unfortunately, United have the bold fraud. Liverpool don't. Liverpool got three wins out of three. And we're already two losses into the Premier League. We got nine last season, the most we've ever had in our history. We're already on two. <laughs> Minus four goal difference. It's looking good, man. It's looking good. United are going to be up there. Oh, God almighty. United are going to be up there. What can you do?